How many of you uh, played hide and seek when you were a kid? You're pretty familiar with this game. So for the few that didn't raise their hand, let me explain how this works. <laughs> Somebody goes and they find a hiding spot. Now, I don't know about you, but when we were a kid, we used to cover our eyes and think we were hidden. Yeah. And then you learned you actually had to find covering. You had to go find a place to hide. And you could stay there for a long time if you were really, really good. I think the world champion at hide-and-seek right now is still Bigfoot. (laughs) But you would find a place to hide, and then someone would come looking for you. So you were in your little fortress. You were in your little hiding place, and someone came looking for you. But there's a unique thing that happens when they find you. Once they find you, wherever you were hiding can no longer be a hiding place. Am I right? Because every time we play the game again, I'm going to go to that place that you hid last time to make sure you're not hiding there again. So once a hiding place gets exposed, it can no longer be a hiding place. <laughs> Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is speaking. He says, Now I, Paul, myself, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold when you're absent. I I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with confidence with which I purpose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we were walking according to the flesh. Now, that's just a setup statement there. He says, I'm about to tell you something strong. Here it is in three. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Because our weapons are not weapons of flesh, but they're divinely powerful. Everybody say divinely powerful. For the destruction of fortresses. Now, yours may say strongholds. For the destruction of strongholds, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's always been a little bit of a confusing statement, to take it captive to the obedience. The Greek word for obedience there is hupakeie, hupakeie. And what it means is compliance or submission to the things of Christ. In other words, whatever thought I'm having, I want it to be in a line with Christ. I want it to be submitted to the things of Christ. Six. And we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. I think the easy way to say that is when you obey completely, you've punished disobedience. So he talks about the fact that there are fortresses, are strongholds, and I'll more use the word stronghold today, that there are strongholds that can be formed. So what is a stronghold? If I went back and look biblically, and said, what is a stronghold in the Bible? If I go to 1 Samuel 23, 14, David actually hides in strongholds in the wilderness. Maybe it's a cave, maybe it's a rock enclosure, but he hides in places they call strongholds. In Judges 6, 2, Israel hides in the dens and the caves and the strongholds from the Midianites. It's a protected place, it's a hidden place. This stronghold is where they're hiding uh, Second Chronicles 11, Rehoboam fortified his strongholds as he hid from the enemy. Uh, so uh, it's a place where you can 
hide from what is pursuing you. A stronghold in the Greek actually means a castle. A castle. So we go the Hebrew over to the Greek. It means a place of refuge, a place of safety. A stronghold is a place that one hides and finds safety from the enemy. It can be a cave, it can be a rock dwelling, it can be a fortress, it can be an impenetrable place where someone hides for safety. It places one in a place of refuge from their enemy. That's what a stronghold is. But listen to me. Strongholds are the place where Satan also hides from God. Satan uses strongholds. It's a place where he hides from the very word of God. So maybe the spiritual definition of a stronghold is a hiding place for a lie that the enemy wants to place in our life. Uh, John 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Yeah, we know that one. So if the truth brings freedom, then what does a lie bring? Captivity bondage. Uh, Strongholds are lies uh, that we are deceived into believing that keep us from the truth of God. They're places where the devil is hiding in our belief system. Mm. See, we believe something and that something that we're believing keeps us captive. It keeps us in bondage. Uh, Maybe I'm believing I'm not good enough for God to love me. That's a lie. Jesus makes you righteous before God. Uh, God could never use me is a lie. Uh, God says, I know the plans I have for you. Uh, I can't move things in the spirit like others do. That's a lie. The spirit testifies with your spirit that you are a child of God. See, fortresses and strongholds, they're built over time. They, they graduate up, if you will. The scripture says that strongholds and fortresses come from speculations that come from lofty things that come from thoughts that we have. So there are four progressive steps in this scripture that says it all starts with a thought. See, the beauty of you and I is we have complete freedom in our thoughts. We can literally think about whatever we want to. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, So for a man thinks of himself, so is he. Thoughts are inceptions of what we're going to believe. They start at a thought level. Therefore, it says I have to take these things captive because they're either going to lead to a positive thing or they can lead to a stronghold of the enemy. But it says that thoughts actually make way to lofty things. What are lofty things in Scripture? Lofty things are things where I exalt my thoughts above the knowledge of God. That's why it's calling it a lofty thing. So I've had a thought, and now I've decided that my thought can be set against the things of God because I'm elevating my own thoughts. In Romans 3, 4, it says, Rather let God be fine true though every man be found a liar. So God says this, but I think maybe it's actually this. When I take my thought and I elevate it above what God has said, it's a lofty thing. It goes from there, from this place of lofty thing, and I'll show you in a minute how it moves into speculations. Uh, Speculations in the Greek, lagismos, lagismos. It means a reasoning a reasoning that is hostile to the Christian belief. A reasoning that is hostile to the Christian faith. Speculation is when we reason that our elevated thoughts are right and God is not. Now, let me give you an example maybe of a, a reasoning. Jesus can't be the only way. What about Buddhists and Hindus? All of a sudden, I'm taking my thought and putting it above the word of God. And it says, that's the step of speculation is the step right before the stronghold. And the stronghold is where the lie gets believed by me. Now, all of a sudden, I believe. It's when that reasoning, uh, now that I put above the word of God, now becomes a belief in me. And I'm believing a lie. That's a stronghold in you. Listen to me. Believing a lie 
is when the devil is hiding in your belief system. He's hiding in a stronghold. He has found a place of no exposure. He's safe in that place. Uh, A lie is hiding in you, and that lie is safe there because you believed it. So in this scripture, it says there's a a four-path, four-paths, a four-step path. Thoughts, lofty things, speculations, stronghold. Let Let me give you an example. I have the thought, God is good, but sometimes in scripture, he sings angry. That's, a, that's an average random thought. He, he's good, but then it seems like sometimes in scripture, he's angry. I move that into a lofty thing when I say God says he is kind, but obviously he wants to punish people. Now, all of a sudden, I'm elevating my thought about what, and it goes into speculation when I say, you know, what God's actually done is form this exclusive club and everybody else goes to hell. Now I've got a speculation that is one step short of the stronghold, which is God is a mean and angry God. I've deduced that from my thought to my lofty thing to my speculation to now my new belief. God is actually angry and mean. Strongholds are always in conflict with what the word of God says. And strongholds, there are strongholds currently being built. Can we get real? Okay. Uh, Because some of you are going to say, I can't believe he brought that up. But I'm going to bring that up today. I think there are strongholds being built right now in our society. There are strongholds that are being imposed upon us for us to get into lofty thinking, get into speculation, put our thoughts above God's thoughts, and say, hey, this is my new belief system. And the enemy ends up hiding out there. Let me give you a good good one that I see now. I've got about a half a dozen of these. We are a nation that is captured by our past racism. Listen to me, that's a lofty thought on its way to a speculation, on its way to a stronghold. How do I know that? Listen to me. Watch what's going on in our country today as it concerns our racism of the past and ask yourself this question. Are you seeing any solutions offered? Are you just seeing protests conducted? Let's protest and kneel at the anthem. Let's really remove a statue, but let's not talk about racism. Let's just talk about the fact that we're combined to our past and whatever we did in the past. And I'd like to look at NFL players and say, put the money up to train the cops. Put the money up to train the policemen. Put it up to train the black men who are being shot. Do something apart from making it about your protest. It's time to move on it if you're actually wanting to resolve the problem. I'll give you another one. Global warming. Global warming. Listen, we're considered ignorant and stupid if we don't believe in global warming. It's like, how can you not? The water levels are going. The thing, listen to me. I'll just put this in a simple statement and put it to rest as far as where I stand on global warming. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that we think, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that we think we can have an effect on when the earth comes to an end. That's what I think is ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous that we say, well, if we spray enough spray paint cans, the world will come to end sooner. It doesn't make any sense to me because God is still in control and no man knows the hour except God. And when God decides it's over, it's over. We can't affect that. Another lie in our society. Sex is an expected part of premarital relationships. Yeah, you can't marry someone without knowing what it's going to be like in bed, can you? Yeah, see, because the word of God says that the two become one flesh when they're married. And so it's a lie to believe that you would have to know that before you got married because God says you'll become one when you get married. Mm. How about this one? Grace covers sin, so it's okay if we sin. I mean, the Bible says you're given eternal life when you believe, and and so you don't have to stay faithful because I've already got eternal life, so what does it matter how I live? Listen to me. Satan will lie to you that you can act like the devil and receive a blessing from God. It's not going to happen. That's a lie. That's a stronghold being formed in you now. Uh, How about this one? I am a victim of my past, so it's an excuse to remain a victim. Uh, You have to take care of me because I had a hard past. My identity is now in being an abused person, so treat me like one. No, no, because you're an overcomer. 
because you don't have to be bound by the things of your past because Satan wants you to stay there and God wants you to look into your future because you cannot move into your destiny until you leave your history. You have to move forward. And, and oftentimes it's our decision to remain a victim. I'm not being mean. I'm not being cruel. But listen, I've had bad things happen to me. And I can choose to swim in those bad things or move on to what God has next. How about this one in our society? Gay relationships are a good thing. Hey, hey listen, if you don't agree with me that gay relations are a good thing, then you're a hater and you're not a loving person. Uh, let me just make it clear. I have friends in the gay lifestyle. Are they doing something God speaks against? Yes. But did you notice I called them my friends? I have friends who are adulterers. I have friends who are drunkenness. I have friends who are angry. I have friends who are haters. But I love them because God loves them. And I want them to have a blessed life. And so I want to show them the goodness of God. <clears throat> See, what happens is we begin to believe an argument that somebody has made that somehow makes sense that we move above the things of God until we get to the point where we say, God must be wrong on this and I must be right. That's the enemy placing a lying stronghold in your life. What lie did Eve believe? Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that in the days you eat from this fruit, Satan said... Your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a lie. He told Eve she would be like God and you want to be like God, right? And she believed that lie. I could be like God. That would be awesome. Let me take of that fruit. You notice Jesus did the absolute opposite. He chose not to believe the lie that he was presented. Luke 4 and Satan led him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said, I'll give you all of this domain and its glory for it's been handed over to me and I'll give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, it'll be yours. And Jesus said, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Amen. What was the lie that Satan had something better to offer Jesus than God had? Mm. Listen, Satan is always offering a perverted sense of judgment, a perverted sense of justice, a perverted sense of what is right. He calls the darkness light. He calls the light darkness. He calls evil good. He calls good evil. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There are lies that need to be exposed in our life because of the stronghold they're creating, the hiding place they're creating. Here's some of the lies maybe. It's wrong according to God, but if you speak biblical truth about it, it's hate speech. That's a lie. You can say anything, you cannot say anything about sin if you have sin in your life because that would be hypocrisy. That's a lie. Ooh, it got quiet. Why can I say something about sin if I have sin in my life? Because I can help you out, brother, and you can help me. So when I point it out to you and you say, well, what about this in you? I can say, you know what? You're right. You work on yours. I'll work on mine. We'll both be better. Mm. You need to tolerate whatever people want to do because it's between them and God. But Todd, if a person believes they're a cat and they come to your house, then you should have kitty litter. That would be the loving thing to do, right? No, that would be enabling perversion. Listen, cat boy, I'm not going to have kitty litter at my house because you think you're a cat. I'm going to talk to you about what God designed you to be and who you are and what he has for your life and how you're believing a perversion and a distortion. It's not about tolerance. It's about truth. Mm. We must be willing to expose the strongholds in our life. It's like hide and seek. It's like hide and seek because a stronghold is where the devil is hiding in your life. But once you find it and you expose it and you bring it down, we don't allow that to be a hiding place ever again. 
It's like hide and seek. Let's go find the lie that we've believed and let's expose it so that place can no longer be a place of hiding anymore. How do we do that? How do we expose those things? Open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1, I'm going to be in verse 8. Then the Lord stretched out his hands and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Let me read that again. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant with the words of God planted on his lips. He could destroy and overthrow strongholds. Are you seeing this? With the words that were put on his lips, he was able to destroy and overthrow those things that needed to be overthrown. So what does that look like? We have to expose and dislodge those wrong thoughts and those wrong beliefs. The destruction of a stronghold is exposing the hiding place and the lie that's there. We need to repent for believing that lie and we need to refill that stronghold with a new thought, which is the truth truth of the word of God. It's like hide and seek. Once I find the lie that I'm believing and I can expose that lie, I get it out of there and I put something else back in. What am I going to put back in? The very word of God because the word of God is truth. So if I can put the word of God back in that place, there is now truth in that place and it's no longer a hiding place for the enemy to place a lie. Are you getting this? Stay with me just a little bit here. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by who? God. By God. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God can be adequate and equipped for every good work. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth, Jesus said to God, because your word is truth. I want to speak into your life today. And I want you to recognize that culture and our society and our enemy is finding strongholds in the people of God. It's hidden under words like tolerance. Tolerance and love are completely different things. Love is tolerant, but love has truth. Tolerant is not love because it doesn't always have truth. You should write that down. I didn't even know I was going to say that, but that's really good. <laughs> there are times in my life where I figure out I'm believing a lie. And most of the time that lie is about what God or can or cannot do with me. See, I've been convinced by the enemy that I'm not close enough to God for him to do amazing things through me. I've been convinced by the enemy that he did. He doesn't want to use me now. He's put me on hold because of a sin that I did. And so I just need to stay quiet for a time. Uh, maybe he's taught me that I'm unlovable and that I shouldn't expect people to love me. Maybe he's taught me that because of my past, I can't be loving. Uh, that uh, I was, uh, who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody this week. Um, I was talking to Roy Frampton. Listen, I grew up in a home where my father never told me he loved me. My father never hugged me. Now, my father wanted to make sure I grew up strong and a man and not effeminate, and that was his plan. And it took me years to realize that I was not a very loving person to my own children that I wasn't hugging, that I didn't say I love you enough. Why? Because it wasn't in me, and I believed that because he treated me that way, that was the best thing to do, and it was a lie. It was a stronghold, and I had to recognize it, I had to break it, and I had to become a loving person. Look at your life. 
There are areas where you're not getting breakthrough because there's a base lie. There's a stronghold there. And what we need to do is bring the truth into that situation and say, this is what you're believing, but this is what the word of God says. Which one has a higher opportunity of being correct? The one that God said. So I have to go expose this lie. This is why this scripture says, let's go back to the very original scripture. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we are taking captive every thought. Why does he tell us to take our thoughts captive? Because it's the inception of the lie. If my thought is not in alignment and compliance with Christ, then my thought is wrong. And if I continue to go down the path of a wrong thought, I'll walk straight into a stronghold where the enemy will put me into believing a lies. And so when something becomes a stronghold, it has made void the word of God. Let me say that again. When a stronghold, when a belief in your life has become a stronghold, it has made void the word of God. That's going to create all kind of chaos in your life. Because now whatever God said doesn't seem to be true, and you don't know what to do with that, because I can't seem to make the word of God be true because I'm believing a lie, and I've got to expose that lie and get it out there so I can receive the truth. Listen, some of us need to receive the truth so we can get healed. Some of us need to receive the truth so you can forgive. Some of us need to receive the truth so you can stop holding resentment and anger. Listen, the lie is that you can't be set free from the evil things someone else did to you and you've got to be miserable. I don't know how many times I can express this. I'm not being mean. I'm saying I have to express this over and over and over. Listen. If you don't forgive, you're carrying the burden. The other person is not worried about you. Your husband who's having an affair is not out there saying, oh, I hope this doesn't hurt her. He's not. He's doing what he wants to and it's wrong, but you're the one that's suffering because you're carrying the unforgiveness. You have to let it go. What's not right, it's not right what he's doing. I agree. But who's suffering from his wrong? Him? No. He's enjoying what he's doing. Who's suffering you? Why? Because it's wrong and you got hurt. And you can choose to carry that hurt for years. And it won't change your ex-husband. It won't. It's the same way with people at work. It's the same with your friends who betrayed you. If you don't let it go, you're the one that's going to suffer. Why does Jesus say you need to forgive 70 times 7? Because when we get to the magic number of 490, they're forgiven. (laughs) No. What he's saying is you should never not forgive. Why? Because you're going to be carrying a burden if you don't forgive. If you would forgive, you wouldn't be carrying the burden and you would let it go and you would have joy and peace and the fruits of the Spirit and those kind of things. Why? Because you... Let it go. Is it right what they did? No. Are you going to be the one that carries the anger and resentment about it? You can. But all you're going to do is steal the joy out of your own life. Let it go. It's a lie you're believing. Here's the lie you're believing. The lie you're believing is that if I stay angry about it, eventually they will repent. Anybody? It doesn't work that way. That's what the enemy's telling you. You have a right to be mad. Stay mad. Stay mad, you have a right to. They did something wrong to you. That's a stronghold. We have to have freedom. Freedom says, I let it go and I walk in joy and peace of the Lord and I watch the Lord walk all things together for good. I watch him vindicate me for I've walked in my integrity. I watch the scriptures say, I can walk out of that thing and not carry it forever. Thank you so much for joining us today on Revive Us Now. I hope that the word today has been beneficial to you. I hope that the Holy Spirit would just plant it in your heart and you could see the changes come about in your life. 
If you'd like to know more about Revive Church, join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come and see us in one of our services on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart. Thank you again for being with us. God bless you and have a great day.